Good day, everyone. This is Mike Karp. I'm an analyst with Patak Noel & Associates, an industry analyst and consulting firm located in the U.S. and in the U.K. Uh, today, we have a very interesting panel. I have uh, senior technologists from EMC, HP, IBM, and NetApp, and we're going to talk about where these major providers of uh, cloud infrastructure are going to be driving the cloud during the next uh, several uh, several quarters and perhaps extending out into the uh, next several years. Uh, we certainly have the right people to, um, to discuss this. I'll be introducing them in one minute. But first, uh, our agenda. Uh, I'll be doing some introductions. We'll have a, an eight-minute presentation by each of the panelists. This will be followed by a question and answer session. Uh, if you have questions, and we sincerely hope that you do, please submit them. The, uh, the, the rules of the road for submitting questions are look down at the lower right-hand uh, side of the screen, uh, select the, uh, the All Panelists uh, uh, option from the drop-down menu, and uh, type in your question and click Send. We'll answer as many of these questions as we can during the Q&A. If you do not get your question answered during this session, by all means, ping me. I'll put my um, email my email address up at the end of this session. I will make sure your question gets through to the appropriate presenter, and uh, you'll get a response, uh, I'm sure, very quickly. So that's the uh, uh, that, that's those are the ground rules. Uh, and now let's get started. The uh, four panelists we have today, going in alphabetical order, are Chad Sackage. Uh, from EMC. Chad uh, spends a lot of time looking at VMware, uh, but uh, also uh, in many respects has been the, uh, the public face of many aspects of cloud for, um, uh, for EMC. Uh, from Hewlett Packard, we have Jeff Ho. He's Director of Strategy from the Office of the CTO at HP Storage. Uh, he uh, came on board HP from the, uh, during the three par acquisition, uh, he was director of product management and marketing there, and he's been uh, responsible for uh, he was responsible for directing and expanding three three par's position uh, with uh, cloud service providers. Um, Lauren States from IBM is the vice president of cloud technology and client innovation. Uh, Lauren uh, uh, started at uh, at IBM as a systems engineer and uh, uh, was. Um, uh, has, has since had a, held a variety of technical and sales support uh, leadership positions uh, immediately prior to her current position. She led a team that incorporated clients' technology requirements into IBM's stra uh, strategy. Um, today, Lauren is responsible for the uh, technology strategy for IBM's growth initiatives, which include cloud computing, smarter planet, business analytics, and emerging markets. And fourth, uh, from uh, uh, NetApp with uh, the interesting title of Cloud Czar. We have Val uh, uh, Berkovici. Uh, Val leads NetApp's strategic planning team. Uh, he's in the office of the CTO. Uh, he works with customers, analysts, alliance partners. Uh, Val focuses on next generation research projects and is responsible for NetApp's product vision. Uh, Val introduced the first cloud standard to the industry as chairman of the uh, Storage Networking Industry Association's Cloud Storage Initiative. Uh, and um, previously, Val served as uh, vice chair of SNEA's Solid State Storage Initiative. So those are the players, and uh, we're going to get right into it. First, uh, we're going to turn to uh, the EMC uh, presentation, uh, Chad. Um, Go right ahead and just tell me when you want me to move the slides along. You bet. So uh, thank you very much, and thanks uh, uh, not only to you, Mike, and to the folks at uh, CloudSlam, but um, to everyone who's attending. Uh, I thought what would be useful is in the short time that we've got to uh, describe our kind of fundamental strategy. Our, our goal at EMC is to be the undisputed leader when it comes to uh, cloud infrastructure, uh, working with enterprises and with uh, service providers. And that starts, I think, by... Uh, like any uh, partner for our customers, understanding what our strategy is. So um, to us, we think that um, the long-term state around uh, cloud is not going to be uh, around the definitional battles that seem to reign today about what's a private cloud and what's a public cloud. And in fact, we don't even think that um, private clouds, 
traditional, you know, on-premise uh, infrastructure that you own that you operate uh, as a cloud, or public clouds operated by service providers are going to be the 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 end state. We think that um, the, that progress is well underway, and where we see people getting the most when they start to use hybrid cloud approaches. So that requires that you're able to federate your information as well as your applications uh, from the private cloud to the public cloud. And if you click, Mike, um, ultimately that creates a thing where you're less sensitive um, uh, about where information stays so long as you've got a common way of, of uh, uh, managing information and policy and security uh, in those models. And being able to not only easily move in but also move out gives customers more choice. We're starting to see customers around the globe who uh, have been using public clouds exclusively um, uh, or uh, private clouds exclusively in 2011 and 2012 are, are very much looking at it going, where do I get the most leverage and what's the right thing to put in the right place? Uh, let's go to the next uh, next slide. So, um, uh, you know, as we go through that, what we're finding is that uh, infrastructure plays a critical role in this. There's no doubt about that but that uh, there's a lot more to it than, than just uh, the infrastructure pieces. And what we're finding is that this is uh, driving a lot of change and, and significant changes uh, throughout the whole technology stack. Um, and and uh, I, I don't think that we're unique in this. I think, frankly, a lot of, a lot of the folks that are, are looking at this are realizing there's a lot of things that are transformed by this uh, transition towards cloud models. So the first thing is uh, uh, there's a foundational layer that's required to support the actual infrastructure that runs the private clouds within enterprises and the large-scale public clouds at service providers. So if you do a, a click there, Mike, um, that we view internally as being uh, cloud infrastructure. Um, and the next layer up, which is in a sense to most customers perhaps more important than the infrastructure itself, are the applications, and there's really three variants of that. Existing applications, some of which can be replatformed, some of which are very, very difficult for our customers to, to change. Then there's also new enterprise applications that the customers want to build on new frameworks, and uh, the primary thing for them there is, how do I develop against those frameworks in a way that is portable, and how do I accelerate my time to market around the new applications that I'm going to develop? Uh, in fact, most customers, when they look at it, they see that by building new applications, that's the way that they can get the biggest win for their, their business. And some of them are deciding that they don't want to build the applications themselves. They want to start to use more SaaS applications. Um, and again, it's not going to be about one or the other of these things. It's really going to be about continued evolution around all three of these things. So if you do the next click, our strategy says there's got to be a way to create an application platform for every one of those variants uh, in a way that, that uh, is open and uh, gives customers choices. And then the third thing is that we're finding ultimately the most important thing at the top of the stack is the users. And, um, you know, it's always fascinating to travel around the globe. When you travel at any airport, uh, the number of iPads are overwhelming. Uh, the vast majority of people, when you ask them, is that a corporately issued device, they go, no, and uh, you can pry it from my cold, dead hands. So, you know, we've now got this uh, uh, idea of uh, the consumerization of IT. People want to have their information, their applications on the devices of their choice. Um, and, and that's a very difficult technology challenge. But ultimately, it's about the users, then the applications, then the infrastructure. So if you do one more click, um, end-user computing is going to be as transformed by cloud models as uh, the infrastructure layer is. Now, if we spend a little more time on this, give me one more build, Mike. Um, at the infrastructure layer, what we're um, uh, doing a lot of investment in is uh, around uh, the, at VMware, which of course operates as an independent uh, company, but is a critical part of uh, EMC's larger strategy around go-to-market and, and cloud. It's very, very important that they're able to partner uh, completely openly and completely uh, uh, transparently with every one of the folks that are not only here on the panel, but um, are out there in the market. Um, to give customers choice, but at the same time, it's important to understand that it is a central part of our cloud strategy is around how do we build pools of pools. And underneath that, this is where the infrastructure is being driven by uh, 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 changes in processor design, memory design, 
the implications on storage around efficiency being efficient towards large scale models, towards scale out architectural philosophies uh, and other data services. At the cloud application platform, you can see that there's been huge investments in Spring Source, which as an example of open, is an open, uh, an open source technology. The vFabric technologies, which include technologies around in-memory databases and all those sorts of things. There's as much change happening occurring around databases as there is everything else. Uh, last week, uh, Cloud Foundry was launched, which is an open PaaS um, uh, platform as a service cloud for not just uh, Spring fa uh, frameworks, but others. And then in the land of end-user computing, you can see a whole series of uh, uh, expansions, including recently expanding out by transferring the resources of Mosey, which is one of the leading cloud backup applications uh, to add to VMware's portfolio. Now, if you go to the next build, um, as much as those things are all changing, you know, the panel today has uh, a, a large number of uh, folks, and I think a lot of the discussion is going to be focused around infrastructure. And to us, if you take a look at our, you know, roughly two and change billion dollars worth of R&D, we're, we're betting big down this path. It's significantly more than half, and, and here I'm talking specifically about EMC's R&D budget. We think that the technologies that are going to become very, very important are being able to move towards very large-scale pool designs, pools not just of CPU and network, but on the storage side, being able to scale up to petabyte file systems and multi-petabyte file systems, to be able to scale up to thousands of devices and do it in economic ways for the service provider, but also being tightly integrated into the uh, OS stack, whether it's VMware or if customers choose Zen or other approaches as well. We do think that virtualization is part of cloud. The second set of technologies that we think are very, very important are technologies around the ability to federate because, um, you know, I, I fully expect there to be discussions over what's happened to Amazon this week. I think it's foolish to say that, hey, Amazon had an outage and therefore public cloud models aren't secure or reliable. Uh, if you take a look at Amazon and Google, they deliver SLAs which are astounding. The only place where it would be a problem is if you weren't able to move your applications and data out of them. In other yeah, words, if, you bet. If they have a bad day, you know, that's great, but if you can't move out, then you've got a challenge. Being able to build trust and being able to federate trust, so things like the RSA Cloud Authority. And then the last thing that is very important from a technology standpoint are new consumption models. Whether customers want to mix and match or whether they want to buy uh, converged infrastructure is a big part of cloud as well. So if you go to the next slide, I think it's um, uh, basically uh, the wrap-up, and that's it. Um, you know, I think that you'll see throughout the discussion a lot of uh, places where uh, there's agreement and consensus, uh, but uh, this is a change that's driving uh, the entirety of EMC and VMware with a decided focus. Okay, thank you. And now we'll turn to uh, from uh, HP. Jeff? Yep, can you hear me? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, let's just uh, dive right in. So, um, Chad will get no disagreement from HP on the uh, the notion of hybrid being the way to go. Um, lots of our research and customer discussions, et cetera, tell us that um, this really is kind of the, the optimal kind of economic, optimal, you know, agility uh, way to go. So, um, as you look at that, HP's approach is one that um, we feel is very pragmatic, very practical, and that is to put ourselves in the role of the CIO and ask ourselves, you know, what does he or she need? You know, in what ways can he or she be enabled to be successful in getting to hybrid if they're not there already? And uh, the four sort of, um, you know, pillars of that are in front Jeff, of us. Jeff, excuse me, this is, this is Mike. Um, just speak a, li a little more loudly, please. There's uh, a, a couple of folks who are having difficulty hearing you. Okay, thank you. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Just hold the microphone to my face. Um, so um, the foundations uh, for that are around transform and build, manage and secure and consume. You can see that here. But these, for us, are sort of the roles that a CIO uh, needs to play and the things that they need to do. They've kind of transitioned more from just a, a builder of internal services to more of a broker of uh, between services. And uh, they need to worry about, uh, you know, between those internal and externally provisioned services, how they're going to secure them, how they're going to manage them from one point, 
um, there are definitely a whole set of um, issues as it pertains to transforming, let's say, from traditional uh, ways of doing things to, let's say, a private cloud or public cloud. So in all these areas, uh, HP has a, a pretty rich set of assets and ex expertise and global presence to, to help the enterprise get there. So if you go to the next slide, we'll just uh, go down a little level of detail. Hello? Hello? Wow. Jeff, this is Lauren. We can still hear you. Okay. All right, perfect. All right, so on the transform side, um, what you should think about here is a very you know, rich set of, of uh, consulting resources who can help people plan and, and design and, and deliver on this vision. Um, you know, HP is, what, a 30, 300,000 you know, person company, most of which are in services, and uh, some of that came through the acquisition of EDS. And there's just a rich um, you know, repository of vertical and horizontal kind of information that can be brought to bear and help people uh, make this transformation. Um, there is something that um, something called a cloud discovery workshop, which, which is one way in which this is all brought together. Uh, we invite folks who are interested to come and meet with some of the major technical experts in these various areas. There's no PowerPoint, and they come up with you know basically a customized roadmap for individual clients on how to get from point A to point B. And there, again, there's just a lot of rich uh, expertise to leverage in exactly how to do that in ways that are, you know, um, have the governance and compliance and whatnot that are, um, in many cases, very industry specific. So, um, go to the next slide. So, in this other uh, area, which we call manage and secure, um, and in particular, as, as we were talking about before, we're trying to get to a, a hybrid cloud. Um, there is a, an architecture and a set of software capabilities that are have been designed basically to get people um, to this point. And uh, billions, of, billions of dollars of investment and acquisition dollars have been spent to compile a, a very rich software stack that actually enables the architecture that you see in front of you, um, all from one vendor. There's no pieces that have to be, you know, gotten and. Uh, extracted or coordinated with any other um, sort of vendor. So it's, it's all here. And um, as you can see in the architecture, there is an ability to, uh, from one control point, leverage traditional, leverage virtual in a cross uh, hypervisor way, and also to not only use resources that you may have in your own private cloud or traditional environment, but also to access back-end resources that could come you know, directly from the cloud. And uh, again, all from you know one kind of control point, one user um, uh, point. Some um, names that might you know uh, I don't know uh, be, be meaningful to people here include you know HP OpenView, um, Opsware, which is a large acquisition that HP made, ArcSight, um, things like that. So anyway, next slide. And then in terms of uh, building one's own um, you know, private cloud, um, the, one of the centerpieces here is something called HP Cloud System. HP Cloud System combines elements of the software that was mentioned previously with uh, the industry's leading you know, blade system architecture as well as uh, the most kind of scalable, efficient storage platform um, that, uh, that we know of. And uh, again, you're getting again many of these same benefits in something that's pre-tested, pre-bundled, uh, et cetera. And uh, I guess you know the the note that I would leave you on here is that this architecture, um, prior to its you know sort of bundling together, uh, was already widely widely adopted by some of the most demanding infrastructure folks in the industry, namely um, many of the, many of the largest uh, service providers. So. Um, it's proven. So in, in some respects, you can think about this stack as being something that was uh, proven first and then uh, bundled together uh, later, which I think offers um, some good assurance to customers. So anyway, those are some of the main um, elements. If I have any time, I'll just mention that uh, the one other sort of pillar on this has to do with uh, consume. And uh, if you go back to the first slide, if, if you're able, the uh, the last pillar there has to do with actually 
creating and letting customers consume directly from HP um, infrastructure as a service or outsourced uh, managed servicing. And uh, we've been told over and over again that uh, customers have problems and they want them solved. And the answer to a problem sometimes includes different elements, building, selling kit, you know, consulting, but also being able to consume from that same vendor uh, managed services. And uh, that is a key area uh, as well. And there's a broad spectrum of um, services that um, that HP can provide, uh, again, on a global basis in terms of uh, outsourcing and infrastructure as a service. And there's a whole uh, roadmap uh, there to which um, to which we're committed. So those are some of the, some, some of the basics. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is this is Mike. Uh, we'll be turning to uh, to Lauren uh, from IBM in just one moment. But first, uh, there are some of the some questions are starting to queue up already. Uh, if you want to uh, enter questions, uh, look to the lower right hand uh, corner of your screen and to enter the questions there. I'm going to ask the panelists, enthusiastic though I'm sure you are, to wait uh, to answer these until uh, the end, and uh, we can get. Uh, a lot of the questions that are that are coming in uh, are likely to be uh, quite broad based in uh, in terms of their interest so uh, uh, thank you and uh, now we'll uh, let's see we'll we'll turn to um, Lauren hi we'll turn we'll turn we'll turn to Lauren uh, and uh, there's your slide set so off we go. Okay, well, thank you, Mike, and good afternoon to everybody on the call. Um, as Mike mentioned, I work on the corporate strategy team responsible for uh, the technical strategy for cloud computing. And prior to this role, I stood up clouds uh, in clients around the world, primarily in government, telcos, and financial services sector. So it's really great to have the opportunity to take that insight and work with our development and research teams to make sure that we continue to drive the right capabilities for our clients and partners. Um, I put together two charts to describe IBM's strategy and in particular how current technology trends are shaping the outcomes that all of us want to deliver to our clients and our employees. And then I'll try to pull it together by showing you, I think, a really cool example of what is now possible given the range of technologies that we have to work with. Um, and so I'll start with this notion of what's going on in the market and what we've noticed over the past few years is that Businesses in the world at large have become much more instrumented, interconnected, and intelligent. And just to fact, uh, toss out a few fun factoids, uh, data is growing at 6 trillion bytes per second. IP traffic will accelerate in three years to over a trillion gigabytes. And as of last year, there were an estimated 30 billion RFID tags uh, across the global eco ecosystem. You know, even on a personal level, we're changing our professional and personal habits because of the capabilities that we have with the devices we carry. I know on my device, and I'm sure all of you, you manage your professional life, you connect with friends and family, you transact business, and you use them to stay abreast of everything around, around you. And in fact, my colleague, uh, Mickey, has coined a new term, prosumer, which is the combination of the professional and the consumer. And why this is important is that it's going to impact how organizations serve both their clients and their employees. Um, but I would say that as exciting as all of this technology is to us as um, a technologist, we have to put it in the context of the business environment, which of course is impacted by economic pressures, including eroding margins, growing levels of commoditization, shortened product life cycles, globalization, and that coupled with chronic problems of underutilization of IT and the imbalance of corporate budgets between New development and maintenance creates a lot of pressure to transform IT. And with this pressure, there's a lot of opportunity to use this new technology to leverage to create competitive advantage. So when Mike asked us to look at the future, and I thought about this, I felt that there were four trends which are very interrelated and game changers. And if we look back in five years, we not, might not be able to separate them. Um, and they are social media, mobility, analytics, and cloud. So let me just build on that and start with um, social media, which is part of um, the consumerization of IT. I completely agree with uh, Chad on that point, that that's important. You know, today consumers rely on social media more than enterprise product information for ratings, um, you know, information about new products and services. They want businesses to know and customize the experience to them. 
They want flawless customer service, and they expect a really efficient supply chain to provide it. And so there's a lot of opportunity for businesses to leverage social media into key business processes, um, but also to gain advantage the advantage of consumer models like Facebook and Twitter uh, for collaboration in the enterprise. And this will help with capabilities such as expertise location, communities of practice, the ability to follow subject matter experts to learn from, and a broad range of capability that will make an organization much more effective. So I think social media underpins the future. Now, um, we can all relate to mobility, as I say, said before, it changed the way we work and play. Um, and now we can do anything, anywhere, and in fact, we expect to. Um, so to prosper in a mobile environment, an enterprise has to extend its applications to mobile devices and to assure a superior quality of experience. And of course, providing this end-to-end -end is quite a challenge. You know, it's not just about the device. We in IT have to start thinking about isolation of one mobile extension and environment from another, say, personal use from corporate use. And we have to think about what it means to secure enterprise applications on devices while allowing employees to use it for other activities without corporate policy restrictions. This is why many of us carry two devices today. Uh, and so there's a lot of work underway at IBM to figure out how to extend enterprise apps securely, how to manage them at scale, how to build new platforms that support multiple personalities. And of course, all of this will be influenced by how the ecosystem developer uh, develops, including device vendors, carriers, ISVs, and system software vendors. So building on this, again, we're seeing new ways to deliver value with analytics because businesses have access to an incredible amount of information and a strong desire to discover insight and identify patterns. And establishing and enabling the line of business to understand and manipulate big data is clear competitive advantage. And the cloud is going to play a really big role in big data and providing the elastic infrastructure needed to manage um, and gain that insight. And so then I think about cloud, which really, as the fellow speakers um, have mentioned, is changing the, the game in regarding the economics of IT and service delivery. And the clients I work with have considered cloud as a means to transform their businesses to be more agile. Many of them look at cloud as a means of efficiency and are on a journey to consolidate, virtualize, standardize, and automate. But I think more excitingly, a lot of clients, including service providers and telcos, are building new businesses by providing everything from infrastructure to platform to software and industry services on the cloud, leveraging their existing infrastructure uh, for their existing clients and entirely new markets. And so as vendors, we have the challenge to assure that we create technology and services that our clients can deploy to deliver SLAs required by their users, both consistently and economically. And this is easier to achieve for some applications versus others. Um, I completely agree that these cloud services will be delivered in a hybrid model, and in fact, IT will become a broker of services that provides both internally uh, and acquires from an external ecosystem, depending on how the organization manages availability, integration, and security concerns. Um, and clients will have to identify what workloads are ready to move to the cloud, redesign key processes to support cloud implementations, and determine what attributes are best for their, what cloud attributes are best for their businesses. And of course, remove barriers, which include not only technical and operational barriers, but I found in some of my work, cultural barriers. So given these trends, what IBM is starting to do is designing our cloud services to be client controlled. We think that clients will determine the platform, the security and isolation levels, the required performance, the stack, and their payment and billing options, to name a few. And in the end, some applications will run on commodity cloud services, while others will have more robust enterprise attributes. And or in clients, one minute. Okay. Well, for clients who are building their own data center, we've got to provide um, the technology that allows them to deliver service in a very secure way. So if you could go on to the next slide, Mike. I want to give an example of, I think, a really interesting application on how a, a consumer need drove a business outcome which leveraged a lot of the technology we discussed, which is why I think there's some exciting things ahead for us. Children's Hospital in Boston 
many of you know, is one of the largest pediatric medical centers in the U.S., offering a complete range of services uh, for children from 21, uh, birth through 21 years. Um, and, and they often find themselves needing to consult on serious illnesses for children around the globe in areas that lack their skills and facilities. Um, so there was an instance of this that happened with Dr. Burns, who was called in to help a girl from Guatemala in urgent need of critical care. And he had to coach the local medical team remotely with no real sense of confidence that the procedure would work. So as he considered how to improve the success rate of remote high-risk procedures, Two unrelated incidents influenced his decision. Now, the first one I bet a lot of you can relate to. He observed his son gaming with an interna international group of players and wondered if there was something in how they were collaborating that could be leveraged by physicians to share knowledge across the world. My daughter is a big gamer, so I get that. Um, around the same time, in navigating the Masters Golf website, he noticed features such as player analysis, instant updates, and the ability to interact with other virtual attendees. And he wondered if this could also be applied to his challenge. And he wanted to leverage these technologies to create an environment without walls. Um, and as a result, Boston's Children's Hospital is deploying a pediatric intensive care unit without walls, which enables learning and collaboration for physicians around the world, access, gives them access to medical information, for a child when they need it, and it's all deployed on a cloud infrastructure. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you, Mike. Thanks, Lauren. And uh, now uh, Val from NetApp. Thank you, Mike. And hello to everyone in attendance here. I was scanning some of the names, and certainly some very familiar names in past lives and on Twitter as well. So enjoying speaking with you all. Looking forward to your questions. Uh, looking at the previous uh, presenter slides, I'm kind of glad I chose this particular subset going last alphabetically. I think it will complement uh, some of the material presented here earlier on, hopefully not conflict with it too, too much. Uh, one of the observations I actually had just in preparing for this panel was that it's a pretty small world in a cloud space, uh, so much so that uh, not just really being in competition with a lot of my fellow panelists for cloud business, I find myself more in partnership with them than anything else, whether it's you know, IBM through our N-Series OEM relationship and through some of the Ingenio technologies in a DS series, whether it's HP Enterprise Services in particular, who's one of our biggest uh, customers, actually, as we go to market with cloud-based data protection solutions. And, of course, it goes without saying, the VMware division of EMC is uh, one of our largest partners and really a large contributor to our overall corporate growth lately. So one of the things that we've established early on in forming our cloud strategy, this is going back almost three years, and it's something that wasn't clear to a lot of people in the industry until very, very recently, is that there are ultimately going to be a lot of aggregators of service, so basically a lot of winners in the cloud space. And we determined that as a company maniacally focused on storage infrastructure for the cloud, we didn't ultimately want to be in competition with these people. And we decided very early on not to offer a NetApp, you know, NetApp hosted cloud storage service, but rather enable all of our customers and, and therefore partners, particularly the service provider partners, to deliver, you know, either self branded or NetApp branded cloud storage services, but hosted by our partners, leveraging the service expertise that our partners had. And that's a, a key part of our strategy. And in talking with a lot of those customers, we ended up coming up with a formula that uh, is largely reflected in this slide here that has a couple of animations. And what you'll see me doing is actually focusing on the interesting contrast I've observed over the past couple of years between the application perspective of cloud and the infrastructure take and requirements to support applications in the cloud. There's certainly a, an interesting set of contrasting cultures and requirements as well as some very important integration going on as this cloud movement evolves and progresses. And you'll see terms emerge. I've noticed Mark Benioff, amongst others, of Salesforce.com start to coin these terms, Cloud 1 and Cloud 2. And I'll try and explain what each one of those mean. So Cloud 1 essentially is very much an infrastructure-oriented perspective on delivering applications in the cloud. It's very much around taking existing legacy applications or, or current applications with a, a machine or hypervisor focus, virtual machine focus, and delivering them in the cloud. 
And we've worked with this, uh, this framework. We've been working with our service provider partners for quite some time now that has held up. It's really stood the test of time. Essentially, most of our service providers, whether they're you know, on-premise or off-premise, uh, enterprise IT or an actual public cloud provider, really need to maximize their margins. And whether it's through showback, chargeback internally, or whether it's actual you know, hard currency billing for a public provider, we've noticed that uh, there's three key elements that separate you know, your top-line price and your bottom-line cost. So if you build out the first animation, please, Mike. <coughs> what we notice is the first one is very much around trying to give the customer as much choice and flexibility as possible. So whether you know it's current events that are business oriented, such as what Iron Mountain recently announced for various business and, and shareholder reasons, actually that they're divesting some of their cloud businesses and, uh, and essentially shuttering them and returning data back to customers. So whether you need that kind of flexibility with regards to business risk or technology risk, as Chad referred to with the Amazon outage today, open standards or at least widely adopted de facto standards give you that critical application and data portability. And I, uh, as you mentioned, Mike, happen to chair the cloud, uh, the SNEA, Storage, Storage Network Industry Association Cloud Storage Initiative. And that particular initiative is all around uh, a proposed standard that will soon be ratified by ANSI and the ISO, which is the Cloud Data Management Interface. That offers complete application and data portability in the cloud and certainly helps you mitigate some of the risks there. If you keep advancing, please, Mike. So the next thing we've noticed in speaking with our service provider partners is the fact that a truly unified infrastructure from the compute layer through the networking layer down to the storage layer gives them that elastic quality they need to get to an economy of scale. They don't have to you know, plan, build, and run uh, a small uh, infrastructure separately from a medium infrastructure, separately from a large infrastructure. That unified infrastructure really gives them the ability to you know, have a very flat organization and you know, a truly elastic cost structure, which lets them have an elastic pricing structure, helps them be competitive with some of the best of reads out there, such as Amazon, Google, et cetera, and, um, and lets them obviously be able to still enjoy some of that margin. And that includes not just you know, primary storage perspectives, but the secondary and tertiary storage in the form of data protection, online data protection, online high availability business continuance, having those capabilities integrated into the infrastructure as opposed to add-on products are also an essential dimension and element of a truly unified and elastic infrastructure. So the last build, please, Mike. And finally, this is one of the lessons we learn in kindergarten and applies very, very much in the cloud space, particularly for infrastructures. We have to learn to share. Deploying a lot of physical assets and dedicating physical assets to individual tenants is for obvious reasons not a very um, you know, a scalable or effective way to, to build out a profitable infrastructure. You have to be able to take full advantage of either machine-based or resource-based virtualization and share a lot of physical assets many, many times over to get to an economy of scale and separate yourself, you know, your top line price from your bottom line cost and get to margin. And finally, automating all of this is really more than just applying policies via some interesting GUIs now and third-party solutions. The best-of-breed providers have adopted a mentality that's uh, now recently been termed as DevOps, and that's where they're programming their infrastructure, and they're able to actually you know, treat their infrastructure like an application and have that same agility and have that same high level of automation and low-touch model towards minimizing their operational costs. So if we move to the next slide, please, Mike. This is an example of a slide uh, that was presented. I had the, the privilege of presenting with one of our most successful enterprise service providers, T-Systems, the division of Deutsche Telekom. And I presented this with them at a VMware breakout session in Copenhagen, so the VMware Europe event last fall. Val, one minute. Thanks. And what it clearly illustrates here is that you know you need to uh, not only have that automation, the unique intellectual property that T Systems provides, but that as you have a very very open top end to your IT stack, you have to ultimately consolidate down at the bottom layers to be able to achieve that high level of standardization. And T Systems is famous for actually being able to take uh, the world's largest SAP database, an application that they were uh, that was run previously on site by Royal Dutch Shell 
and and not only virtualize that, but take that off-premise into the cloud and offer the same level of SLA performance, et cetera, but do it at a 30% lower cost for Royal Dutch Shell. Next slide, please. So I'll just tee up this topic, and hopefully we can tackle it in the Q&A. Cloud 2 is very much about an application-centric view of the cloud as opposed to an infrastructure-centric view of the cloud. There are a lot of popular acronyms and names here. And the one thing that you should note is the heart of all this, again, uh, the, the big data movements, the analytics, the content, and Hadoop, of course, is literally, you know, pardon upon the elephant in the room. The heart of all this is very much these new application frameworks, the platform services, and certainly uh, an interesting one that Chad mentioned, VMware's Cloud Foundry, is a very, very influential announcement. Those are, the, uh, the again, the power brokers that we see going forward in the cloud, and that's where NetApp has been focusing a lot of its uh, you know, R&D attention with regards to optimizing not just for hypervisor interfaces, but also for platform interfaces. And this last slide, since I won't have too much time to talk about it, is something people can review later on, but it's essentially a large financial organization, multinational, that is combining a bunch of interesting technologies, taking advantage of the data gravity concept of not moving the data around, but bringing the applications to the data, and using the new, interf the new interfaces, the standard interfaces such as CDMI, to offer data to multiple Hadoop clusters that are dynamically provisioned to uh, deliver services, key services for banks such as fraud detection as well as a risk, a risk analysis. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mike, and we'll get to the Q&A. Great. Thanks, Val. Okay. Um, we've had several questions come in. Um, let me uh, begin by, um, let's see, uh, Lauren, why don't we start with you? Um, what's, hey, what's the relationship between uh, cloud and analytics? Well, you know, I think that there is... Oh, excuse uh, me, and I, I have to say that the ground rules here are 90 seconds, and then I stop you. Uh, you already told us that, Mike, like six times. <laughs> <laughs> Does that count towards my seconds? No. Um, I think there's a lot of synergy between cloud and analytics. You know, the cloud gives analytics capacity when it's needed, um, and I've worked in several situations where... We've used it for real-time detection of attack patterns on defense networks um, so that we can reset our defense posture. Um, you know, we're using it for uh, handling uh, big data analytics or things like genomic sequence analysis. And even in IBM, we created a utility-like business intelligence service within our company on cloud infrastructure to take out costs and get our users consolidated. So, you know, I think that the... The cloud enables a lot of what needs to be done in analytics by being able to provide an elastic infrastructure. You know, there's considerations, of course, around data location and movement, but we're finding that there are enough applications of value that can be done with data at rest um, so that it's advantageous to start leveraging cloud technologies to get the economic benefit and really enable new applications. Okay. Thanks. Um, Jeff, uh, Talk about service providers. Uh, uh, what, what are they looking for? Uh, where, 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 do you, where do you think uh, – what, what are their customers asking them for? Jeff? Well, looks like we've lost Jeff. Um, uh, no, sorry. Oh, I had it on. Oh, we found him. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Service providers, very, very quickly. Um, so apart from, let's say, the Amazons who tend to just buy their own kit and put it – with their own software, then there's you know everybody else, and there's the internal service provider. So that latter group as a whole, you know, by and large, is um, you know this is an act of sort of massive consolidation in many ways, and virtualization is an enabler. And what they want at the end is to have very top thing that they want is to be able to assure their service levels, because if they don't, they you know they break an SLA and they make somebody mad, and in the case of the service provider, will pay you know thousands of dollars in penalties. So Technologies that deliver resilience, um, including that kind of resilience under failure conditions, uh, tend to be very, very important um, because they are for profit businesses um, and uh, in, in more increasingly internal providers are being measured uh, in a profit way, just not, not a cost way. Uh, they need to go fast, and uh, that, has, that has everything to do with um, automation. So they want to pick their best tools there. Um, they also, by and large, have a, a huge problem with respect to unpredictable growth. Uh, tenants, if you will, come, go, grow, and shrink, and they need to handle those in an elegant way. By and large, um, architectures or infrastructures that are scale-out in nature 
uh, tend to win in those environments. Okay. Thanks. Um, let's see. Uh, Val, um, the future of storage in the cloud, where is it, it going to go? So I believe that the future of storage in the cloud is going to be influenced more by application requirements than infrastructure trends. So ultimately, uh, we've had this academic concept of object-based storage or object interface of storage, which is what I prefer. And again, it hasn't had a lot of practical requirements or economic justification until cloud came along. And as we see the cloud evolving, uh, you know, based on infrastructure services, but more and more towards platform services, uh, we'll see the need for really rich metadata and, you know, very, very scalable uh, storage services, which really can't be delivered by LUNs or volumes or file systems. You really have to take it to the next level and implement you know, object interfaces to existing or new storage systems, and particularly uh, programmer or application-friendly object interfaces. Uh, and S3 from Amazon is certainly an ideal example of this. Uh, the SNEA CDMI standard is modeled a bit on S3, but also tries to provide even more portability for data and applications. I see that as being the future of cloud storage, and certainly you know, the vendors and services that will supply that will need to figure out how to cost-effectively deliver those elastic requirements for you know very, very low initial investments and the ability to scale practically infinitely. Uh, and also uh, very, very cost-effectively deliver the integrated data protection because mistakes will happen and outages will happen, and you have to be able to recover from that. Okay. Thanks. Um, Chad, I guess it's your turn. Um, the uh, the issue of uh, using uh, the cloud to provide the platform as a service, uh, and in fact, the, the whole the whole movement into the into the cloud uh, seems to be commoditizing uh, just about every part of the infrastructure stack. Um, Talk to us about the uh, the business pressures this this creates. Um, how do you respond uh, uh, to this, either uh, you know for, through internal growth, growth or through uh, M and A? Uh, you bet. And, and and just a it's a great segue from uh, from the point that Val was making. I mean, if you take a look at how S3 is constructed, right? S3 is a software layer that runs on top of commodity servers with uh, commodity storage, right? Um, if you take a look at the way Atmos is constructed, Atmos, which is an object storage model, is built on top of, in essence, commodity servers with commodity storage. Um, if you move towards platform as a service, frankly, all you're doing is writing to those APIs as an object model for, for, for storage, which means a lot of the economics and technologies that have been built into the traditional uh, block storage models, whether it's from EMC or anyone, the Storage models, whether it's from EMC or from anyone, are are uh, are commoditized. One thing that's that's interesting uh, is that it doesn't just apply, of course, to the to the storage side. It applies to everything, right? It it commoditizes the virtualization layer. It commoditizes um, all of the things that everybody who builds infrastructure does. And all four of the companies that are here, I'll speak only for myself, but I think it applies to all of us. Have got economic um, structures that are built around what are, in essence, legacy models. And the same challenge faces every enterprise that's considering this as well, right? So there's, there's all of these intrinsic, classic things that are, in essence, the way we've always done it. Uh, within EMC, we're actively uh, trying to accelerate the commoditization of some of our own assets. So the move towards everything running on commodity hardware and moving towards software-based approaches is a, one that we embrace. Um, a lot of assets we're increasingly putting out there in the uh, open source community. Um, we think that uh, over time there's more and more value out of integrated stacks. That's something that, uh, that Greg from HP mentioned, and of course uh, uh, Lauren and, and, uh, and, okay. and Val are, are also looking at. But um, the value is moving in different ways, and I think... Um, that creates a lot of that creates right. a lot of tension right. with Chad. Chad, thanks. We've got we've got a lot of questions here. Um, the uh, question from uh, from Christine: um, What application areas uh, would never move into the cloud? Uh, areas of critical infrastructure, uh, et, 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 et cetera. Um, there's a there's a concern in the, in this question about the issues regarding uh, cyber wars, et cetera. So, uh, somebody want to pick up that one? Sure, I can start with that one, and then we can leave some time for others to chime in. Uh, this is Val from NetApp. So what I've found is that um, typically two classes of applications. 
One of them is a stereotypically, you know, highly regulated, highly sensitive set of data or information there where the risk of a leak or the risk of an outage is just simply too high. It's either business critical or sometimes mission, life and death critical. The other one, again, I find a bit more interesting as a bit of an application developer myself is occasionally application integration at the enterprise level becomes so complex and intricate that we need to move one component of that creates too much disruption and risk to a whole bunch of others. So whether you have your manufacturing deeply integrated with your shipping or whether you have your customer support deeply integrated with your sales, I've seen sort of the application integration of certain business critical applications be so complicated and intricate that it's not practical right now to move it to the cloud because of you know one one dependency holding back the rest of them. So those are the two major classes of apps I've seen. Having said that, that leaves about 80 plus percent of other applications that are perfect candidates for cloud uh, services and hosting today. And I've you know I encourage many people to look seriously at that. Good. So Mike, do you mind if I just do a little quick addition onto that? Absolutely. Please so go I, ahead. Uh, I, I, you know, I agree in, in principle with Val. The one thing I'd say is that first distinction, which is absolutely a barrier in the customer's mind, um, sometimes has grounding in reality if the service provider can't attest to compliance models and security and isolation encryption, those sorts of things. But that's not an intrinsic barrier. So I think over time that, that category will shrink and shrink and shrink. It will probably never disappear, but um, will shrink to near zero. Yeah, and Mike, um, this is Lauren. I'd just like to add one more thing, if you, if I might. Sure, uh, you know, of course. So what, what we've done is uh, we've been asked this question quite a lot over the past two or three years, and we've actually come up with a model that we can um, ingest a client's architecture, uh, their workloads, their data, et cetera, and figure out what applications are uh, amenable to the cloud for where they are and which applications uh, are not. And what we find is that customers kind of walk up a ladder where they start with the lowest risk, which happens to often be development and test environments, collaboration, I mentioned uh, business intelligence. Uh, but lately we found that more clients are moving towards uh, low SLA uh, production applications, maybe tier three, tier four. And what we find is that they have to really decide what their risk appetite is and what the level of investment they want to put into the cloud. Um, because you probably could move anything, but the question is, what is the value? But we actually have codified this for ourselves uh, because we've moved a lot of workload to the cloud within IBM, and we make that available to our clients as well. Okay. Um, we're, we're coming close up on the hour. Uh, maybe, maybe time for one more question. Anyone else want to throw in anything on this one before we move to the next? Okay, then a uh, question from, uh, from Annette. Uh, what analytics and uh, 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 business intelligence, intelligence information do you see uh, as being usable or uh, consumed in uh, consumer and, uh, and, and prosumer areas? Uh, what business uh, intelligence services would be delivered for free? Uh -huh. And what uh, uh, BI services would be delivered on a, a fee-for-service in public clouds nature? Uh, well, uh, you could have asked me for free because IBM is a for-profit institution. Is that right? <laughs> well, uh, other than your, cor your uh, corporate spirit of altruism. <laughs> other than our corporate spirit of altruism. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of, uh, we've got a big focus on uh, commerce and have been acquiring companies that can do analytics on web traffic, trends, how effective um, marketing campaigns are. And also, we've acquired uh, Sterling Commerce, which provides very good business-to-business -business integration. We started to organize all of this into a smarter commerce cloud business process solution. And so what we hope to do is to ingest all of this information that comes out of the social media, Facebook, Twitter, web traffic, et cetera, make that actionable through the capabilities of Core Metrics and Unica and then feed that back into the supply chain so that customers can adjust the levels of um, inventory that they have or ship where. I think we're at the beginning of this. I think it's a nascent kind of area, uh, but a lot of potential. And so um, just watch this space. We, we have a really big focus on analytics and IBM and hope to attain about $18 billion, I think, in incremental revenue over the next couple of years, so you should see some pretty exciting things. 
Okay, so thanks. Just, Anybody else want to chime in? The quick, the quick thing I'd say is our, our theme of EMC World, coming up to a theater near you in Las Vegas, May 9th through 12th, is cloud meets big data. At EMC, we think that these two are intrinsically linked. It's driving our M&A strategy. We've made major acquisitions in this space with, with Greenplum and other scale-out analytics models. Um, you're going to see more and more. Uh, we're already doing boatloads with Hadoop and others, and we're going to do more. But there's two quick things. One, you've got the option now of uh, a very easy to scale out commodity uh, compute resources as needed. As someone pointed out earlier, I think it was Lauren for uh, workloads where the data uh, not being local is not um, um, is not a showstopper. But the other thing that we're doing is we're trying to go at what what if the data could be local without being local. So there's all the stuff that we've been doing about VPlex on one level is about active active storage models. But the other idea is what if you didn't need a VPlex? What if you could literally burst the data into the into a service provider that doesn't even have the the equipment or facility, and then they could access the information, whatever bits of information it was needed, um, as if it were local, even though you actually have all the data on site. Um, so there's lots of intersections about how all this stuff is going on. It's it's a really, really exciting time, I'd say. You know, people are doing it now, and stay tuned for a lot, lot more. Okay, thanks. Uh, Last-minute comment from uh, from anybody else? Sure. I mean, let me give you a unique uh, NetApp take on, on analytics. Obviously, the, as an application category, the market is white hot, and we love it. It's big data, which means big storage. However, uh, what if you could apply real-time analytics to your infrastructure? And uh, we've actually made some initiatives in this regard with regards to an Acquiry acquisition and a bunch of R&D that I lead. And that lets you actually implement policies to actually uh, – you know, take uh, immediate action, automated remediation of an SLA violation. You know, say that 10 times fast. What that means, though, is when you have something that's ha happening that's not expected, you can have real-time analytics actually detect that and kick in a policy to remediate that, whether that's provisioning additional virtual machines to handle front-end application load, uh, provisioning, provisioning, I should say, additional VLAN bandwidth if your network becomes a bottleneck, rerouting it, obviously, if you have a network outage, and back to the storage layer, if you're having, you know, particularly, you know, disk bandwidth or controller bandwidth issue, a bottleneck somewhere, being able to provision additional logical or virtual controllers, uh, being able to provision additional spindles in the back end of a volume to handle more IOPS or capacity, those are all possible right now with infrastructure-based analytics. And it's something that, again, is an exciting development in terms of uh, a truly elastic, you know, low-touch highly automated cloud infrastructure that a lot of leading edge providers are deploying right now. Great. Okay. Well, we're coming up on the uh, on the top of the hour. Um I have to uh uh begin by uh, apologizing to those of you who did not get your uh your questions asked. Uh my email address is uh mcarp at Patak Noel uh is uh on on the screen right now. If you want to send me a question and tell me whom you'd like routed to, I will be very happy to do that and it will and I will do that before the end of the day today. Um Finally, uh, thanks to our panelists. Uh, not only did they uh, provide us with a series of, uh, of, of interesting and, uh, and I think, thoughtful uh, presentations, but uh, as a personal thanks, uh, uh, I want to uh, uh, express my appreciation, appreciation for the fact that not once did anybody make reference to the fact that all of this is a journey. Um, those of you who attend lots of corporate presentations, as I do, know exactly what I mean there. So thank you very much. Uh, this was, uh, I think, a, a useful uh, meeting, and I uh, uh, wish you all a great day. Thank you. Thank you.